I'm Thomas Hendricks for Chronic 24 in New York City, and today we are sitting down with Larry Schechterman, the wizard behind the curtain for all your favorite watch drafts. Works with auction houses, watch dealers, some with their own YouTube channels, micro brands, you name it. We're gonna go over the materials used, history lesson, and what makes a good strap. We have everything you can imagine here, different ages, different materials, different colors, different construction. Larry, let's just dive right in. You yeah. wanna start with some vintage stuff just to kind of set the scene. We have a lot of really cool watches here and a lot of variety of straps as well. I think it's important today to look at history of strap, quality, construction, and the fashion behind straps. Thomas, I brought some of my collection of watches today because they'll be able to illustrate some of the history of watch strap making, American watch strap making, and there are some very unusual things here. We could start with this Gruen Curvex, um, which is a very historic model for the brand. A very different looking strap than what I would expect with this time Absolutely. Period. So this is a calfskin that was stamped with a herringbone pattern, and then the, the skin was obviously tanned. So highly unusual for the period because as we continue through, you're gonna see that there was mostly a lot of solid black and brown yes. straps in the yes. period. This is maybe the most fun thing on the table. Um, this is also a period correct strap. Yeah, what kind of material are you working with this here? This is condor. Condor. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so as I say to people, I think in the 1950s, they made straps out of anything that moved. You could find pig, elephant, condor, chicken, lizard, alligator, crocodile, because the truth was they were easily at hand and they were interesting in terms of look. So this would be a very unusual strap for the period, but there was a lot of use of skins like this. And it's held up well, I will say. It has, it's virtually new old stock. The other thing to look at is this is a Waltham Premier, probably from the 40s. This would have been the original strap that was shipped with this watch. It is a simple one piece pigskin construction and very typical of that period in American strap and watchmaking. So as you're looking at this strap, as a, at the skin, we can also talk about construction. If you turn over the strap, yep. you'll notice it's a one-piece construction. There is no lining. Yep. The top is just stitched down. Very simple construction, American made, and they lasted a really long time. I mean, this strap on this watch has lasted for 70 some odd years. So let's get granular because I know as an end consumer, one of the questions I have is how much the strap's worth? Am I getting my money's worth? Exactly. Is it gonna last? Exactly. A lot of times you're looking at a thumbnail online and you zoom, zoom, zoom in, right. or you pause a watch review at a certain second to like maybe exactly. see the stitching on the side. So as someone who has built these things, has provided straps for auction houses and other dealers and other brands, what makes a good strap, Larry? So when you go to buy a shirt, Mm -hmm. I think the first thing you do is you touch it yep. and you go, is this cotton? Is it silk? Is it what, it, what is the fabric? The first thing I look at from a strap perspective is, is skin quality because that's going to affect longevity. Yeah. And a lot of that will be driven by country of origin. So I look where the strap is made. Most straps are labeled made and made in Italy, made in China, wherever it may come from. One of the, cri the critical piece as well, besides the skin quality, is clearly the construction. So there are two basic types of construction. Although this is a top-end strap, this is the lower-priced construction when you go to make straps. Okay, and what we, is this called? Okay, we call this cut edge, mm -hmm. okay? And in a cut edge strap, all of the materials are basically brought to the edge, the strap is cut, and then it is stitched. And then, as a last process, the strap is edge painted. Sometimes people make straps where this edge paint portion is contrast. You may have fun and say, I want a black strap with red edge painting. That can be done, of course. Most of the time it matches the leather yep. or it comes close. A top end construction would be Rembordet, okay? And the top brands, top clients use Rembordet heavily for high priced straps. Things like alligator, lizard, ostrich, things of that sort. And it's a hand process, mm -hmm. but what's done is the top leather 
is wrapped around the fill and the lining, and then there is a lining stitch to the back. Very often you can tell because you'll see this portion at the top the way it is. The wrap around part, right. yeah. You won't see that here. You can also make rembordé where it is actually brought to the top, the lining. Mm -hmm. But the key is to look at the side of the strap and notice that top leather rolled around the back. Yeah, I've seen the term rolled edge. Is that what that's exactly, referring to? Exactly, exactly. And the best place to look is near the lug. Mm, yeah, you can see on the side the you actual folding. I think the last thing to look at as well when you're looking at construction of a strap is stitches per inch. Because you do want as many stitches as possible on a strap so that it stays together, that it's more durable. What you'll also notice is that these are all Italian made straps, the new ones that I'm going to show you. All the stitching is straight. Most of the watch straps that are made outside of Italy will have sort of a diagonal stitch process, which the Italian factories don't favor. This is considered best quality, state of the art, the best construction. Those are the two types of construction. The other thing that is made are things like cordovan, like that green strap, if we look at that, this is a single piece construction. Yeah. So this is Horween cordovan from Chicago, but because the leather can be thick, you don't necessarily need a lining. And what a lot of accounts want is that Horween stamp, which appears on the back of the leather. Yeah, it's practically a household name by this yep, point. Absolutely. So this is the least construction cost that we've seen as far as like exactly. manual labor, but- All the it, money is in the skin. It yeah puts more focus on the materials themselves. One of the things I think that's sort of important to talk about is a regular strap versus quick release. One of the things we haven't talked about yet is really trend and what's happening in, in, in the strap world, and that is that straps have become a fashion item. Guys wardrobe their straps to their watches. The newest thing that I'm getting a request for, and it's not new, but it's from a trend perspective, is quick release. These cost a bit more than a standard strap because it's separate operations here, but it is spring-loaded. You put one side in the, in the watch, in the lug, and then you just pull the bar down and the other end slips right into the hole. Yep, easy. You can do um, it in the morning when just like tying your shoes. It, it takes two seconds and it's an easy thing. You see more brands doing this now as yes. well. I think it just makes the product a little bit more yep. marketable. Yep. And as much as I feel like stabbing yourself with a spring bar tool is part of the rite of yes, passage of joining many wounds, this many industry. <laughs> I am glad to see, we use the word trend, but I think this is something that is just- It's utilitarian. It's gonna, it's, it's here to stay. And I do wanna talk about sizing as well. And I think one of the big questions that people have run into is they get a, a watch they fall in love with, but it's 19 millimeters lugged with. Okay. What, do you, what do you do? This is a critical conversation because it will affect whether your watch is snugly affixed to your wrist mm -hmm. or you may walk down the street and find your watch on the floor okay if that's important a conversation an important thing to know is your lug width on a watch and just so that we can point it out that is the distance between these lugs on the watch smaller watches obviously tend to have smaller lug sizes yeah, but it's here. yes but it's not always the rule because this watch is from the 1920s and this is a 20 millimeter strap. Exactly. Yeah. So you must know the size of your strap and you must fit that size to your watch. Talking about a 19 millimeter, that was a question I was asked by one of my first accounts. A strap that is too small will cause your strap to come off the watch, okay? Because what's happening is you're getting play in this area. That spring bar is moving around and at one point or another, it's going to come apart. Yeah, we've all seen the, the James Bond movie where the, his native was like a full two millimeters too small. Exactly. The opposite applies when you take a strap like a 20 and try to put it on a 19 because what you're doing is two things. You're doing damage to the watch yeah. because there's all this friction happening at the lug area and you're damaging the strap yeah. because you're actually taking the leather and squeezing it, compressing it, and you're just damaging it. Yeah, it's so the pressure. Right. To the point where some of these, we call them naked leathers, a, a leather without sort of a glaze on top, yeah. you'll actually see the leather turn color at mm -hmm. the lug when you start squeezing it. So it's critically important to know your lug width and finding the right size strap. Let's talk about another thing, length. 
Straps are sold in small, uh, regular, and long. Some people also make extra longs. That's important from a fit and comfort perspective. I happen to have a, quite a small wrist. I can be right in between a small to a reg. Don't you hate how that happens? Uh, uh, yes. So I have to try on straps or, you know, at least understand. One last thing about construction and fit is the balance of a strap is critically important when they're being made. That is, what is the length of this top portion and what is the length of this bottom portion? They must be properly aligned or else you're gonna be walking around with your watch sitting like this on your wrist. Mm. So less expensive or poorly designed straps will not have your watch sitting in the center of your wrist. Skew, yeah. Exactly. So I think we've covered so many topics already. To me, and I think this is the strength of my business as a watch strap manufacturer is color. I love color, Same. okay? Look at this color card. Yeah. This is just one example of a classic leather that I use. But my strength in the marketplace is the color offering. I can offer you a basic brown, a dark brown, a black, or whatever it is, but think of the fun that you can have with these straps. I, I have friends who have Rolexes, oh, I have to have that strap. Mm -hmm. You know, that looks like Rolex green. Yeah. I think everybody needs to have a little courage and break out. It's always fun to also pull out dial colors with yes. your strap. So if you have a chronograph with a red subdial, how fun would that be? Yeah. So I think you should take advantage as a consumer of color offerings, brands that offer color offerings, because I think today that's where the fun is. For historical context, we started off with really just kind of black brown, and brown, brown, brown black and brown. In the 40s, 50s, <laughs> and even the 60s, I would say. Yep. And then now you have the whole world in front of you. And with technologies like quick release, you right. say, maybe today's a light purple day, but tomorrow I have a meeting, let's go back to black. Yeah, totally, sure. Bring a couple with you in your pocket, switch them out. Absolutely. I, I, I'm as crazy as that, but yes, that is a possibility. <laughs> Larry, thanks so much for coming in today. It was not only a history lesson, but the nitty gritty about what makes a good strap. Very valuable knowledge that I think is gonna save people a lot of money down the road. This is Larry Schechtman. I'm Thomas Hendricks of 2024. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.